Okay, this how-to video is going to talk about AUKAD CIP, the Component Information Portal, and it's um, it's a way to is well, it's, a, it's it is a database. So it's a, there's a starter database, there's a, there's a predetermined database structure that allows you to um, add parts, to edit parts. Um, you can add parts from uh, some of the distributors, people like DigiKey, Farnell, Mauser, and it allows you to kind of manage your part data in, in a nice simple format. So usually with your CIS or, or C, your CIS database, um, it might be an Excel database, it might be an SQL database, but you've got, if you need to add new parts or edit parts and stuff like that, you've got to go and open Excel or open Access or some kind of interface to SQL to add, add new lines, edit lines, etc. like that, and then be able to access it. So CIP actually gives you um, a couple of ways to access it. We can get a tab actually inside, um, let's just log out here, a tab inside OK Capture, so I can then uh, log in here using my Windows login or um, a username and password that I can specify in the system. I can also access that from an HTML window. So if we go to Internet Explorer and we go to um, the CIP portal, I'm actually using it using a, a, a local host window. So this would only use a CIP license rather than a, a Capture CIS license. Um, and you could have purchasing maybe having access to this if they wanted to, you know, add manufacturing part data. So you have a company part number, they can update costings or quantity in hand, stuff like that. So it can be really useful um, to edit parts that way as well. So let's, um, let's just log into CIP. So we'll just log in um, using a username and password. Let's just minimize that. Uh, so Along the top, once we've logged into CIP, I get an admin functionality where I can do things like um, look at the distributors, I can synchronize the distributor data, so that allows me to update things like quantity on hand and costing information directly from them. It's really useful to be able to do that and keep your, your, your database up to date. There's configuration, there's um, user roles and permissions, so I can add users, um, build different roles for certain people, so if I wanted to give people some access to the database, if I look at the, the, the role, sorry, I can actually um, add a role and then give people the ability to maybe only create and edit temporary parts, but they can't add manufacturing parts. Some can people add rules. Um, the purchasing, for example, the default one can only edit and add, it, add manufacturing parts, but they can't add anything else or delete parts. So it's a real way to control who has access to do what. Okay. There's a components tab so I can look at the individual um, table information, so that all the individual parts. Let's pick a capacitors, for example. So on the capacitors table, I'm actually seeing the part information that I would see in a CIS Explorer window. So my part number, description, PCB footprint, number of pins, etc. Um, I can do things like preview, so I can preview the PCB footprint. And that's just going to launch the Allegro Free Viewer, and that allows me to effectively see the PCB footprint. That's fair enough. I've got the same for a schematic symbol, so I can preview the schematic symbol. And if I wanted to, I could actually physically then place that on the schematic canvas if I've got a design open. Uh, things like these functions aren't available if you're using just Internet Explorer to access or an HTML window to access that. Um, and this gives me all the information that I need. If I go down to the manufacturing section, I can add multiple manufacturers to the same company part number. So this is my company part number here, um, but I've got different manufacturers for that same part. Um, which can then be output on a bill of materials. So if purchasing have permission to, to, if they can't get parts from AVX, they can maybe get the parts from Kemet, they can go and access that data. If we scroll down to the bottom, we've also got the distri distributor information. So this distributor is providing this part number, they've got this quantity on hand, and this is their individual pri break, price breakdown with a unit price as well. So that can be useful if you're trying to do a costing for your bill of materials. Um, there's a mechanical parts function that allows you to add mechanical parts. This is ideal if you want to have uh, a connector that has a screw, a nut, a washer, etc. Rather than physically placing individual parts like that on a bill of materials, you can add a mechanical part associated with this. So every time I call that connector up, it always then uses that screw, that nut, that washer. So you're then not having to worry about remembering to add those parts to your bill of materials. There's a history tab. So it records every change to, to the part when the change was made, who made the change, and what the change was. Um, so it allows you to keep a good record of your part history to find out who's been doing things to your parts. And that's the same for manufacturers as well. So you've got your component information and your manufacturing information. There's also a where use tab. So 
you have the ability to import a bomb csv file into cip um, once you've done that then you can then look at where this part is used so this specific company part number is used on you know these these five different bombs so say a part goes obsolete you can then find um, which bombs it's used on so you have to go to each design and maybe swap that part out or find a part um, an alternative for that part okay there's a distributor search if you're looking to find data on the database so that's quite a useful function you can build different searches and save searches and export data um, there's also a distributor search so <coughs> from a distributor point of view if I needed to go and add a new part to my database I can go and access people like Arrow, DigiKey, Future, Mailsroom and Farnell from either a keyword or a manufacturing part number whether they're in stock, whether they're ROS compliant and whether they're lead, lead free so let's just use this, let's go find a part so an LMV7231 and that's then off using a, an API to go and directly search DigiKey, Future and Mauser. Okay, This is the results it's come back with, so it's found a few with DigiKey and some with Mauser. Um, and it allows me to kind of look at what they've got. So this is the, the basic information, it's given me a quantity on hand and it's given me their costing information. So you'd look at this and maybe say, well, the one with the most quantity on hand is this one. Part numbers are very similar. I could probably, yeah, that's the part I'm specifically looking for. Slightly more expensive than this one, but that's, there's no cost in here, so obviously that's why. So let's pick this part here. I'm happy with this part. This is giving me a breakdown of what I'm getting. So I'm getting a link to the data sheet, their costing information. I've got a picture and any attributes that they've got associated with this part. If I'm happy with this, I can then say, let's go and add that to the ICs table. Um, and I then get some action. So I can, I can choose whether to either create a temporary part, give it a TMP part number, or I can add it to an existing part. If I already had a part with this part number on, a company part number, and I'm just trying to find an alternative manufacturer, I could do it using that functionality. So I'm gonna create a temporary part. I've then got the option for the schematic part and the PCB footprint. So this gives me a list of all the current schematic symbols that I have currently in my IC's uh, CIS table. So do I have a part for an LMV7231? Doesn't look like it. Okay, so we're gonna do a new part here and I'm gonna type it in. My part number is gonna be an LMV7231. Um, there are options to go and look for schematic symbols if you haven't got them using something like the search providers function, or you can go onto the internet and look at people like Ultra Librarian, Symexis, Snap EDA, several people, or you can make your own schematic symbol. So lots of different options here. PCB footprint, same scenario. Can I browse something like that? It's unlikely I'm going to have a PCB footprint for one of these, so I'm just going to click on new um, and I'm going to give it a PCB footprint name. Um, I also then get a choice um, to map um, the field data. So this is the data that they're providing. What field do I want to map it in my CI in my in my database? So obviously these are the current fields that are available to me. So I can choose a specific one or I can just leave the defaults. In this scenario, I'm just going to leave the defaults. We'll then click on add. <coughs> And then this part will then add this to my database part. So I've now got temporary part 450. I've got an unassigned part type, which I'll come back to. And then the, the, the populations or the values have been populated where, where available, okay? So if I went to my schematic page, I can then uh, press Z to place a database part. And if I look under my CI6 Explorer, I've now got this unassigned part type. That's the part type field, my temporary part 450 with the relevant information. Okay, so if I had a schematic symbol and a PCB footprint, I could then effectively select it here. And I have actually got a PCB footprint and a schematic symbol that I access from the search providers directly from Ultra Librarian. So that's available on another video to show you how to do that. Um, so I've added those parts and I could then go and place this on the canvas. Um, what you can do obviously in CIP is you can have an email notification. So um, if I added a part, I could then, it would automatically, the system would automatically email uh, a, a peer or a boss or someone like that they wanted to do a live or a librarian to do a review of the part information that I've added. And once they get that information, they can then come and edit this part. So I get to this location, I say, right, okay, I'm happy with the part. We need to look at this now. So I'm going to auto assign my next company part number. And I've got auto assign functions for description and for part type, which take other fields here and then populate um, a description field. So you can be consistent in the data that you're putting out. You know, if I'm looking at um, <clears throat> number of pins, I always populate the number of pins, so I'm going to populate that value here. Um, my package height, I always populate that, so I'm going to start typing. 
And as soon as I start typing, it's showing me other field or other values in that field so I can be consistent with the data that I'm putting in. Um, I'm now going to say this is a checked part and I can populate more information here if I want to. My part type, um, this is actually the, 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 the field names in, in the CIS Explorer. So I'm going to say it could be my company name. Um, it's going to be an SMD device and this is a, a hex device. So I'll give it a hex folder. Um, that's the value. That's my schematic part. I've got all of those already. Um, okay, I'm happy with all that information. So we'll then click on um, accept and that then physically updates that data. So I've now got a, a proper company part number that I can use. So if I then go to the schematic sheet again, we'll press Z again to place the database part. This time, if we look under the ICs table, I've got a my company folder now with a, an SMD folder and a hex with my proper company part number, my schematic symbol, my PCB footprint. I've got the relational database here. So I've also got a link to a data sheet. I've got the costing information if I need it. I can then double click and place this part directly on the canvas. And if I need to use it, there you go. And if I can then, let's just double click this part. There's all that property information automatically transferred to the design.